Welcome back to our intermediate financial accounting class. In our last segment, we were talking about calculating basic earnings per share. Before that, we talked about calculating the weighted average shares outstanding as part of that EPS calculation. And before that, we were talking about the conceptual background behind earnings per share, why it's important, what FASB requires, how we have to present it in the financial statements, etc. Now that we're done with the basics, it's time to move on to the more advanced earnings per share calculation, and that is diluted earnings per share. To start off this discussion, we do need to talk about a couple more conceptual things, but I promise we'll keep it quick and get right to the tables. Basically, what we need to talk about are the types of dilutive securities. Now, a dilutive security is any security I have sold to investors or given to employees or given out as bonuses to go along with um, trade agreements or to satisfy uh, accounts payable or other obligations, et cetera, that allow another investor or individual to purchase from me shares of my stock. This does not mean the right to buy shares from people who already have them in the market. It's the right to get shares from the company. That's a dilutive security. And they come in a couple of different packages. The first are what we call warrants and contingencies. We're going to focus on warrants. That's the more common type, but, but contingencies exist as well. These are the right to buy shares at a predetermined price. The most common warrant is a stock option. And you're probably all familiar with the idea of a stock option. For every option you have, you can buy one share of stock at a given price, and then you, t you buy it cheap from the company, you sell it on the open market for what the real market price is, and you keep the difference. That's the benefit to most people of having options. From an accounting perspective, I don't care what you do with it once you buy it. All I'm concerned with is I have to account for the fact that you have the right to buy a share of my stock as part of my diluted earnings per share calculation. Warrants and contingencies always dilute earnings per share. They're going to drop it no matter what. Why? Because it doesn't change net income if I issue more shares. It doesn't change my preferred stock dividend. So it doesn't change the numerator at all. All it does is it issues more shares. So my number of shares on the bottom of my EPS calculation gets bigger. Nothing changes on the top. That's going to drop that ratio and it's always going to drop EPS. Convertible securities are the other kind of dilutive securities. This is where I get to swap. I take a bond or a note or preferred stock shares. I give you back your bond or your note or your preferred stock and you give me shares of stock. That's a convertible security. And most of the time, they also drop earnings per share. Why? Because they increase the number of shares outstanding because we've given them a bunch of shares. And usually that increase in the denominator offsets the changes that this conversion causes in the numerator. If I give you my bond, then you don't have to pay me interest. So your net income goes up. If I give you my preferred stock share and you give me common stock, you don't have to pay my preferred stock dividend. So preferred stock dividends goes down. So either way, when I do a conversion, it's going to affect both parts of my EPS calculation, both the numerator and the denominator. Now, before we go on, it's really important that you understand the idea of dilutive securities and these two different categories. It's so important that it's one of our key concepts. So hopefully you're comfortable with the idea. Now, like we just discussed, warrants, stock options, contingencies, etc., they always drop EPS. But because of the way that a convertible security works, it doesn't always drop EPS. If the change to the numerator is big enough, it will offset the increase to the denominator in my equation. And that means that it could actually raise earnings per share. Think of an instance where I've got a bunch of people with bonds, I'm having to pay them a million dollars in interest, and they convert to 10,000 shares of stock. Well, I have a savings of a million on top, less taxes. I've only added 10,000 shares down below. My earnings per share probably pops up. That's what we call an anti-dilutive security because it doesn't dilute and drop my earnings per share value. It increases the value of earnings per share. Now, I wish I could tell you that the rule was, you know what, you take everything convertible and you just put it all into the equation and that's it. You're done. But that's not how it works. FASB wants diluted earnings per share to be a worst case scenario. Well, the only way to get a worst case scenario there is if I use the ones that dilute or drop EPS. If I start using the anti-dilutive securities, it makes it look better. 
that's not a conservative worst case scenario. So FASB says if it's anti-dilutive, if it would bring EPS up, you leave it out. So we have to watch for anti-dilutive securities as we go through the diluted EPS calculation. One other quick aside, from a finance perspective, not accounting but finance, the other reason that we don't include anti-dilutive securities is because they're not what we call in the money. In the money means an investment is worth using. For example, if your stock option is to buy 10 of common stock and I can only sell them for $9 in the market, why would I use them? I'm going to lose a dollar on every option that I buy. So I don't use them. They're not in the money. They're not worth anything. That's the finance piece of FASB's decision to leave out anti-dilutive securities. Now, again, understanding these convertible securities and how they affect earnings per share is a really important part of our discussion. Understanding why we don't include anti-dilutive securities is another of our key concepts. So make sure you're comfortable with the idea that it doesn't give us a conservative number and they're not in the money. So from a finance perspective, they don't make sense either. Now that we've talked about dilutive securities and the basics here, it's time to jump into our calculations again. So let's start with the basic steps to calculating diluted earnings per share. And we're going to start just looking at the scenario with warrants or stock options. If we only have warrants, don't have any convertible securities, then we just have three steps to the process. Step number one, we figure out basic earnings per share. Step number two, we figure out how many new shares we would have to issue to satisfy these stock option or stock warrant holders. Step three, using these new shares, we recalculate earnings per share. Now, three basic steps, that sounds really easy, and it is once you get the hang of it. The most challenging part of this is going through step number two. So let's break that down into some steps as well. How do I decide how many new shares I would have to issue to satisfy warrants and contingencies? Again, stock options being the most common. Well, first, we figure out how many shares the warrant holders would get. Then we figure out how much cash they're going to pay us to get all of those shares. Third, I'm going to take all of this cash that they've just given to me, and I'm going to buy as many shares as I can from my current owners. And then whatever I can't buy, then I'll issue new stock. Why do I do it this way? Well, most companies try to keep their owners percentage. So instead of just issuing as many shares as we can, we assume that we would keep the number of new shares low so that our owners could maintain their percentage. So this is how we do it for a diluted earnings per share calculation. How a company actually chooses to do it is up to them. It's a finance decision and an investment decision and an owner relations decision. So there's a lot of other concepts that come into the decision. Do I issue brand new stock? Do I buy back? What do I do? I, do I keep the cash that they give me so I can use it for other investments? That's up to the management team. But from a diluted earnings per share calculation perspective, FASB says we go with this calculation and we simply assume we'd only issue new shares for the ones we couldn't buy. Let's go ahead and do an example of this. This again is JKL Corporation, same example that we just did a minute ago, but now we're adding on some excitement. So you can see this first part is all exactly the same. What we're adding is that they also have 40,000 stock options that have been outstanding all year long. Each option allows investors to buy one share of common stock for $10 per share. Now that's the default, one for one, but you can issue options that are two for one, one option, two shares of stock, one option, three shares of stock, four, five, whatever. So you do have to look at the option contract just to make sure that you've got the right conversion options to shares, but typically it's one for one. They have the right to buy them for $10 per share. They can do it anytime in the next five years. The market price during year two was $40 on average, and the ending price for our stock was $45 a share. We wanna calculate diluted earnings per share. So step number one, is to calculate basic earnings per share. And I've done that already. That was our first example. So just as a reminder, we had $840,000 of our net income minus preferred stock dividends, and we had two seventeen five hundred dollars as our weighted average shares outstanding. And it gave us an earnings per share of $3.86. That was basic. EPS. Step two, we need to figure out the number of new shares that we would issue. And again, we're going to break this down into several sub steps. 
So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to figure out the total shares that we need. And to do that, we take the number of warrants, options in this case, times the shares per warrant. So for our example, there are 40,000 stock options. Those are our warrants. And each option gives you the right to buy one share of stock. So we're going to need 40,000 shares, or we would need 40,000 shares if they all came in and exchanged. Again, please remember, all of this diluted stuff is just imaginary. What if not this really happened? Next, we're going to figure out the cash from selling the stock. To do that, we take the total shares needed times the price per share. And this is the price per share from the warrant. In this case, total shares needed is 40,000. I'll bring that down. And the price per share was $10 per share. This is the option price, not the actual amount that is being sold for on the market. So we would get $400,000. My next step would be to figure out the number of shares that could be purchased. And to do that, I take the total cash and divide by the average market price of my stock. So for our example, total cash is this 400,000. And the average market price was $40 per share. Not to be confused with the ending price. We don't use ending, we use average. So I could buy 10,000 shares with the money that they give me. Next, I figure out the total shares that will be issued, which is what we're looking for in step two. To do that, I take the total shares needed minus the number of shares we would purchase. So total shares needed, that's this number, 40,000. Total shares I could purchase, that's this number, 10,000. So my new shares comes up to 30,000 shares. So I have 40,000 warrants. I would buy 10,000 from my existing owners and I would give out 30,000 new shares. And that's what goes into my calculation of diluted earnings per share. Step three is to recalculate my earnings per share. So to do that, I'm going to bring down the numbers that I already have from up here, my basic earnings per share numbers. 840,000 was my numerator and 217,500 was my denominator. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring these new shares and add them to my denominator. Now, normally at this point, I have somebody stop me in class and say, wait a minute, that's supposed to be a weighted average number of shares. That's not a weighted average. And my response is, well, think about it like FASB. If you're FASB and you're trying to come up with a diluted earnings per share, worst case scenario, how much would it drop your value or your ownership of this company? When would you assume that these options were exercised to get you a diluted earnings per share number? Would you have them do it at the end of the year, the middle of the year, or the beginning of the year? Well, the worst case scenario would be if they had all come in on January 1, and wanted their shares right then because then they'd have been part of our calculations all year long earnings per share would drop by the most so if i want to get a real diluted number that's what i'm going to assume on all of my diluted eps calculations that the new shares issued on january 1 well 30,000 times 12 out of 12 stays that 30,000 i can just add it right in so with that said let's do this calculation 840 divided by this 247,500 gives me new EPS of 3.39.
If that was my only dilutive security, I'd report $3.86 as basic earnings per share and $3.39 as diluted earnings per share, and my income statement would be done. Now, we're going to stop there. There's more fun to come, though, because we still have to talk about convertible securities that are going to further dilute my numbers. That's what we're going to jump right into with our next discussion. We'll see you then.